the Sustainability Management Master's program, you are answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. At the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. The Stevens Institute of Technology is proud to present the Hugo New Corporation Sustainability Seminar Series, co-sponsored by Geocentric Consultants, H2M Architect Engineers, Brown and Codwell, and BEM Systems. Thanks very much. We got some music in the background here, or whatever. But uh, um, I'm glad to be here. I appreciate the invitation from the professor and from Alex, who I guess couldn't be here today because of an illness and uh, the help with logistics from uh, Samir. Um, I, I think this is my first time on the Stevens campus, uh, so I'm glad to be here. And um, I'm also glad to be here because uh, two months ago I was in the middle of a nine-day intensive care stay at a hospital in Brooklyn. Uh, little uh, brain surgery to relieve an abscess on my uh, left frontal lobe. So I'm glad to be anywhere right now and uh, glad to have the chance to sort of test my brain and to uh, see what I remember and can put together as a, as a presentation. So what's that uh, thing in the middle? Is that me? Okay, so I'm told I have uh, 40 to 45 minutes. I'm not sure how much of that I will take, maybe all of it, maybe less, but hopefully plenty of time for uh, questions and discussion because there's a lot to, uh, to talk about uh, in this topic of, of the world of uh, garbage that I've been living in for the last uh, 30 years. Um, my uh, intro covered uh, some of this. The last, uh, um, uh, there was a period of about 10 years where I got to work all over the US and Canada, and I'll touch on that uh, in a little bit as well. But the last four years, I've really been focused on the New York City commercial waste and recycling uh, system. So here's what I'm going to cover in the presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my personal background and the pro professional and political perspectives that I've gained uh, from working in this field. And talk about, because I often get the question, how do you stay informed and up to speed on what's happening in this uh, uh, broad, complex uh, arena? Uh, 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 list of, or talk briefly about some lessons learned uh, over the years. Uh, take a quick look at some current issues in the field that are in the press and you may be reading about or working on um, in, your, uh, in your work here. Uh, end up with a handful of fun uh, cultural references to how waste and recycling is being talked about in the media these days and then open it up for, uh, for uh, discussion. Let's skip over one. Let's see, which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to. Everyone uh, has a personal connection to waste. How many of you generated some today? A little bit, a lot. Any idea where it's going? Uh, how you know where it came from? All those sorts of things. Uh, what attracted me into this field is this uh, uh, discussion about uh, uh, what we buy, use, throw away, where it came from, the choices we make about products uh, in our daily lives, and taking a behind the scenes look at materials and toxicity and all those sorts of things. And then thinking ahead to what happens when we're done with it, uh, whether it's a single use uh, uh, product or something that's uh, more multi-use or durable, what happens at the end of its life? Uh, how does it collect it? Uh, how does it get processed? Uh, what are the markets for that? 
Uh, and then how do we evaluate and compare uh, materials against each other? Uh, and we'll get into that discussion a little bit here as well. So I'm going to jump back to, jump to that. Here we go. Um, I reorganized my, uh, my slides a little bit after I uh, sent them over to uh, Samir. Uh, so I grew up mostly in the Midwest, uh, born in Kansas, raised mostly in Illinois, which means I'm a child of the Midwest and have the uh, sort of uh, resource conservation ethic that comes from being in farm country. Uh, I did a lot of uh, paper drives as a kid. Maybe that's what got me interested in uh, uh, this field. Um, I also have been keenly interested in how public issues get talked about. Uh, I did uh, a lot of uh, stuff in uh, high school and college uh, student uh, government, and that's what part what brought me to New York as an urban fellow in 1980, and actually started my career as a lobbyist uh, and policy uh, wonk for the chancellor and the Board of Education in, uh, in New York City. Uh, you think back to the 1980s, and a few of you might uh, ha uh, have been born or around by then, uh, but it was still a time in New York, at least, and probably in this region where uh, apartment houses uh, still had uh, incinerators uh, in their basement, uh, and they were burning trash on a daily basis to, uh, to get rid of it, which meant there was a challenge to manage not the waste, not the garbage, but the ash coming out of those incinerators and, and uh, where to, uh, to take that. Uh, New York City still had local landfills at the time. Uh, there you can see them dotting the, uh, the waterfront now as you drive along the, uh, the Belt Parkway and the like. Um, until 1992, New York City was still dumping its sewage sludge in the ocean uh, before the EPA uh, finally uh, required it to, to stop. And as uh, many of you know, even in the last uh, you know, 20 years, we were still barging most of our residential waste uh, to the Fresh Kills landfill on Staten Island. Uh, by the late 80s or so, commercial waste had stopped going to Fresh Kills and was being exported to places as far away as Ohio and South Carolina, a lot going to landfills in Pennsylvania and the like, but, uh, and some to upstate New York, but uh, no longer managed uh, locally within the city boundaries. Uh, during that period, recycling was voluntary. Um, in the 80s, I was still taking my uh, newspapers uh, tied up and my bottles and cans to a storefront uh, along Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. Uh, there was a recycling center in the heart of Greenwich Village, uh, next to NYU, um, but then in 1989, this is sort of following the, a national trend. We weren't, New York City wasn't the first, I think Madison, Wisconsin uh, lays claim to having the first uh, mandatory recycling law, but uh, 89 is when the city adopted uh, theirs. Um, and that created the opportunity for me to sort of jump into the field. So again, uh, that was sort of the modern era of recycling, the three R's that, uh, uh, we uh, talk about is uh, uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle uh, became the mantra back then. Um, I was the uh, founding assistant director for what happened after stuff got collected, uh, what kinds of arrangements we made for processing of that material and marketing it uh, to various users, both domestic and, uh, and global. Uh, and it was a time of a huge learning curve. There were not uh, sustainability programs like this. Uh, that uh, we could uh, uh, take uh, or that I or others uh, came out of. We were all learning at the same time, uh, making stuff up as we went along, trying to figure it out. Um, the departments of sanitation in New York and other places had never really interacted with markets before. Uh, so they had to learn how to do that, how to, how to deal with other companies outside of their uh, ordinary uh, uh, bandwidth. Um, I often joke about getting addicted to garbage in that uh, period uh, because of all those uh, uh, aspects I mentioned earlier of uh, fascination about where materials uh, come from. It's a real sort of occupational hazard when I go shopping or around a campus, whatever, to look at all the different kinds of things and to think about where stuff came from and all the steps that it took to, to get it to that point and then what we're going to use it, how long we're going to use it for, uh, and then what happens after we're done with it. Um, and then over the last uh, 30 years or so, uh, uh, the recycling field uh, morphed into the sustainability field. Uh, again, the green building movement came along. We'll talk a little bit about the zero waste and uh, circular economy and EPR uh, concepts that are uh, relatively newer in the last uh, five to 10 years or so and what they mean for, uh, for this field. 
uh, learned a lot about environmental justice uh, and where facilities get cited and who gets to uh, um, feel the burden of uh, facilities that, uh, that handle our waste. Um, and then I've been intensely involved, as I uh, hinted at earlier, in the politics of garbage. And really, that's been the last four years in particular of my life, is dealing with the commercial waste industry and a battle with the city of New York over how that industry uh, uh, will be restructured on a going forward basis. So I've been a registered lobbyist for most of my career. Uh, I've hired and managed lobbyists uh, all over the US and Canada uh, in my uh, work that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so I've had a variety of experiences to, uh, to come at this uh, field. I have to say I've never driven a garbage truck. I've never uh, uh, run a uh, recycling facility, uh, but I've been in dozens of them and uh, they're fascinating places if you ever get the chance to, uh, to visit one. So um, I often get asked this question of how I keep uh, track of what's going on in the field. Uh, I brought with me a sampling of um, magazines in the field, if you want to pass that around. Uh, I like all of them back because they're uh, some of them I got as recently as uh, a day or two ago. But uh, they're uh, on the left column here is a sampling of the kinds of publications that address uh, this field, uh, both internationally. There are several from the uh, EU and UK in there, as well as the ones that are domestic to uh, the US. The two at the bottom of the left column. Uh, W and T and Clear Waters, they're from the wastewater sector. And I'll talk in a minute about why I pay attention to, uh, to that as part of my work. Uh, online, there's just an enormous amount of stuff that comes through my, uh, uh, my laptop every day, uh, mostly uh, e, uh, uh, electronic newsletters of various kinds. Some of them are blogs, some of them are you know, uh, consolidators, uh, some of them are you know, reporting on various aspects of the industry, but just a ton of stuff going on out there. Um, and uh, most states have uh, recycling associations and, or various forms of that, and so they're all generating uh, stuff as well. And then there's a ton of conferences. Uh, this is just a, a, a small sampling of the, the big national ones that, uh, uh, that uh, folks in this field um, uh, attend to uh, for keeping up with the field and the networking and the new product developments and visiting with exhibitors and all those kinds of things. Um, and I've been to uh, a couple hundred of those, I think, over the last uh, 30 years uh, all over the US and Canada. Um, and then I didn't put on the slide, but uh, webinars. Uh, probably I do two, listen to uh, two webinars a week on average, uh, including uh, one yesterday about uh, uh, chemical recycling of plastics that uh, we'll talk about. Um, so this is a sampling of just some of the recent reports um, that are on my reading pile. Um, from the Recycling Partnership, which is a domestic U.S. organization that was formed uh, four or five years ago and working aggressively with municipalities around the U.S. to improve their uh, residential recycling programs. Uh, a couple from the EU in the upper right-hand corner is uh, focused on food and uh, uh, drink. Um, the one in the lower right is uh, focused on, and also from the EU, uh, or the U.K. in particular, is focused on textiles. Um, and the reports on the concept of the, you know, uh, the circular economy uh, for different materials or, for, uh, or generally are, it's just a, a, a constant uh, barrage of uh, these kinds of studies and reports that are coming into the, uh, the field. Um, this is taken from the uh, curbside recycling one. I know you can't read it uh, very well, uh, but it's a, uh, the first one is more than 20 million tons of curbside recyclables are disposed annually. Uh, only half of Americans have access to curbside recycling is number two. Uh, the third is that uh, many communities now are paying more to send material to recycling facilities than they are to landfill it. And that's uh, a, a challenge that we'll talk about a little bit in terms of the economics of the industry and what's happened the last couple of years. Um, the fourth one is about the real challenge of contamination in the recycling field uh, and people uh, uh, um, not being as careful recyclers as they uh, need to be in order to ensure the quality of products uh, going to market. Um, and the last is the importance for a broad array of stakeholders to, uh, to work together to address these uh, challenges. 
So shift gears a little bit here because, uh, as I've already talked with Zephyr Frank a little bit, um, um, I actually uh, have been able to work in the uh, wastewater field along with the solid waste and recycling field. And I've been able to do that because of having a long relationship with a company called Insyncrator. Anybody know who they are? Anybody ever had an Insyncrator in their kitchen? One, two, three, so, okay. Um, not as common on the East Coast as they are on the West Coast and the South, uh, but Insecurator is a company that's been around about 80 years now, based, uh, founded and uh, based in Racine, Wisconsin, that is the world's leading manufacturer of food waste processing systems, known mostly for their household garbage disposals, the kind that go in your kitchen sink, right? I see a, a hint of recognition there, okay? Good. Um, so I got involved with them in the mid-90s when they were working with the city of New York around the challenge of residential organics. And the situation in New York is that uh, disposers were legal in the newer parts of the city that did not have combined sewers, had separate storm and sanitary sewers. Uh, but they were not permitted in the areas that had, the older areas mostly that had combined sewers. So the city went through a five-year process of investigation, a couple of pilot projects and the like, and in 1997, um, decided that uh, that, that uh, restriction no longer made any sense. And that if the city was gonna be aggressive at going after organics, trying to collect it in a truck probably wasn't gonna be that effective and that they needed to legalize uh, household disposers citywide. And actually the sanitation commissioner at the time asked, this, asked the, uh, the council in the city to not only legalize them, but to mandate them and provide some economic incentives uh, for their installation and use as the preferred means of getting organics out of household waste. So food waste in typical residential waste is about 15 to 20% or so. Um, and um, so I uh, got involved with them back there, uh, back then, um, uh, built a uh, over 20 year relationship with them. There was a period in which I was, uh, spending three or four, day, three or four weeks uh, a month on average all over the U.S. and Canada on their behalf, uh, leading a variety of uh, demonstration projects uh, with uh, different cities. Um, uh, led to legalization in New York, uh, got Philadelphia to adopt disposers as a building code requirement in all new residential construction. Um, and what it brought, gave me the opportunity to do was this cross-sectoral dialogue uh, with the wastewater sector um, about how to handle organics uh, differently um, than other kinds of uh, waste and recyclables. And the key issue there is that food is mostly water, um, 70, 80, 90 percent water depending on the type of food. It could be 95 percent water if it's fruits or vegetables. Uh, and so it raises a lot of opportunities to think about it differently than paper or metals or glass uh, where truck-based collection may be your only option. If something is liquid and you can slurry it, then you have the opportunity to put it through a pipe and to send it to a facility that is expert in knowing how to, uh, to deal with that. And in the process, you might be able to do some anaerobic digestion. Everybody know what that is? It essentially mimics what your stomach does to take uh, uh, food, uh, uh, let bacteria have a, have, uh, have a go at it uh, to make some energy out of it that keeps us up and uh, around uh, and then create some waste products that have to be uh, dealt with as well. Um, and whether that's compost or in the wastewater industry, the, con the term of art in the last 20 years has been biosolids is what the uh, sewage sludge gets processed into is the end product is known as uh, biosolids. So this whole paradigm shift was going on in the wastewater sector at the time I was uh, most heavily involved with in, uh, within Syncrator, uh, where the wastewater sector was rebranding itself as the water resource recovery sector. Um, the, what used to be the Association of Municipal Sewage Agencies rebranded itself as the National Association of Clean Water Agencies uh, to reflect this new approach to thinking of wastewater as a resource and not as a pollutant. Uh, and understanding the, uh, the engineering and technical uh, opportunities at those, those facilities to make products. So a wastewater plant now, a water resource recovery plant, uh, a WRF if you will, is making three products. They're making clean water, uh, they're making biogas, and they're making a fertilizer uh, type product, uh, often known as uh, biosolids. 
I meant to bring a banana with me today because in these presentations I often talk about the, the basic question of if you've got a banana peel, what are your options, right, uh, to do the right thing with it? And actually, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, NPR was doing a green week. Uh, and they took one of my questions, which is the banana peel question. If I've got a banana peel, what's the best thing for me to do with it? Should I try to compost it myself in my backyard? Great. If you can do that, that's fine. If you got a worm bin in your bathtub and you want to feed it to the worms, God bless you. Good luck with that. Um, but the most important thing is to keep it out of the trash, keep it out of the landfill. And if you've got a composting operation, either uh, uh, or option, I should say, or if you can process it, uh, as in the lower right-hand corner, uh, through a disposer and turn it into a slurry, then you give the wastewater, the water resource recovery plants, the opportunity to go after uh, that material and to make products out of it. Um, this is uh, my work with them, mostly focused on the commercial side, but uh, excuse me, the residential side, um, because disposers are in probably 60% of homes in the US, uh, 80 to 90% of those in California have at least one. So they're a very common appliance, but not well understood by municipalities. Uh, but I also did uh, some work on the commercial side and was talking with Frank about that as well. There are some new innovations on the commercial side for how to take uh, f uh, large volumes of food waste from a campus like this, uh, residence, you know, a, a dining hall, a hotel, whatever else, and turn that into a uh, a, a slurry that can be further processed uh, down the road and made into uh, products. So what did I learn along the way? Um, hopefully a little bit. Let's see, I'm going to flip through uh, f a half dozen things here that, um, um, that I regard as my lessons learned. One of them is that uh, most of my friends think that waste is a pretty uh, static thing, that it's always the same, and it's uh, far from the truth. Uh, if we were having this conversation in the 1920s, we'd be talking about uh, other things than we are today. Uh, even when I came into the field uh, 30 years ago, the composition of municipal waste was uh, two-thirds paper, uh, mostly newspaper, uh, a lot of high-grade office paper. Uh, both those things are mostly gone uh, from the municipal waste system now, been replaced by uh, e-books and whatever else. How many of you still read a hard copy of a newspaper every day? Anybody? I don't see any hands, right? So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rare, you know, when I get on the subway in the city, it's rare to see someone actually carrying a newspaper uh, these days. I still get two delivered, but there was a time I got four or five uh, on our kitchen table. Uh, in the 1950s, as I described, uh, there are companies that are still uh, um, the one company I worked with is called Liberty Ashes. And they kept that name because that's what they did uh, dating back to their founding. It was they primarily focused on dealing with ashes from apartment house and municipal incinerators. Uh, and now fast forward to 2020 and we've got a huge variety of products in uh, our, uh, our consumer stream and our waste stream and the like, many of which are uh, enormously complex and uh, create all sorts of challenges for uh, end of life uh, recovery and reuse. A um, couple of uh, years ago, I was out at a uh, MRF, a materials recovery facility in San Francisco, and the guy on, uh, leading me on the tour was talking about the challenge of small browns in the recycling field. Anybody know what a small brown is? It's an Amazon box. <laughs> uh, in the wastewater field, small brown has a different meaning. Uh, but uh, in the recycling field now, these small browns, uh, recycling facilities were built around to handle larger boxes and all these tiny little boxes coming in now were not being effectively recovered in MRF and they had to sort of retool, re-engineer uh, to recover that material. But it sort of makes the point that we went from old newspaper to old mixed paper to old corrugated cardboard. Those are the sort of industry terms. Even those terms are now changing. Uh, to there's a lot more cardboard in the waste stream than there was uh, five or ten years ago, uh, largely due to the uh, Amazon effect. Um, second lesson is about the language that we use around waste. Uh, when I started, it was reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, a lot of attention to the concepts of diversion and recovery, and I'm not going to go into that unless you've got questions about it. Um, for a while, the term uh, uh, discards uh, came into play. It didn't last very long. 
sustainable materials management had a run for a while. The green building field has now developed a true uh, concept that is uh, their version of a zero waste certification program. Um, uh, organics, when I started, was all leaf and yard waste, and now it's got food waste uh, connected to it, and I already described the branding uh, differences, uh, uh, transition that's occurred in the wastewater field. Another lesson is about, uh, we think of waste as being local, but it really it's global. Uh, we see it visibly at the local level in our daily uh, 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 routines and consumption. Um, but most of the products, as you know, uh, don't come from the US, they come from all over the world. And the, cons the, um, the waste generated in that process is enormous compared to uh, what happens uh, at, the, at the consumer level. I'll come back to that in a, in a second. Um, one of the things that's made uh, conversations in the field, even in the US, uh, uh, difficult to have is that every city and state measures uh, recycling differently um, so that there's no national standard uh, uh, that uh, can be relied upon to sort of compare how one city is doing against another. And in part, that's because waste stream's different. Uh, if you're in the south, you've got a lot more leaf and yard waste on a year-round basis than we do in this part of the country. Um, you will often see reported uh, in the media because it, it got anchored a number of years ago as if San Francisco was diverting 80% of it, its waste, and it never did. And in fact, uh, California a couple of years ago redefined um, recycling rates, and uh, it's uh, brought San Francisco's rate down to about 50%. Um, but that's not what you read when, uh, because of how reporters pick up um, you know, stuff that uh, when it's in the media you know, five, eight, 10 years ago and got sort of stuck and uh, doesn't really reflect the reality. In the last couple of years, you may have seen reference in the popular media because it's crossed over from the industry to uh, the, the regular media about the, the national sword uh, policy in China. Uh, which um, was a dramatic uh, shift because the markets for recyclables from around the world, not just the US, particularly for paper and plastics, was to rely on China to handle those, those materials. Uh, we buy a lot of products from China. We have empty ships to go back. Um, uh, the leading exports out of the port of New York have always been scrap metal and waste paper, and that has been true up until uh, recently. Uh, but China, two years ago, sort of shut the door on imports of, of uh, recyclable materials because, in part because it was getting, uh, they were getting in too much garbage. Uh, material was way too contaminated, and they were being asked to sort of be uh, the, you know, the world's uh, sort of wastebasket, if you will. And they decided that's not what they wanted to do anymore. So they uh, aggressively uh, ratcheted down the uh, contamination levels that they would accept and in large part really sort of shut the door, particularly again for, for paper and for plastics. Um, and what that has uh, started to, ha uh, to result in now is a rebound in domestic capacity to handle materials. There are now reinvestments of closed paper mills in Maine and the upper Wisconsin uh, and some of that, some of those, it's actually uh, Chinese investment that's reopening those mills. Um, there's been a, a, a burst of activity in the uh, plastics field to uh, uh, restore uh, some of the uh, domestic capacity for handling recycled plastics. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, so it's those those uh, ships don't turn quickly or easily. Those are three to five year sort of shifts, and in the meantime. Municipalities are uh, struggling to uh, deal with the uh, additional cost of recycling programs. And you will see in the popular press communities of all uh, uh, sizes saying they can't afford to do recycling anymore. Um, and so they're, they're uh, dropping materials. They're uh, leaving glass out because it's always been a problem. They may not be taking as many different kinds of plastics as they used to. Um, and in some cases, they've been cutting back curbside programs uh, entirely uh, as, as unaffordable. I think in, in New York State, uh, we've, um, one of the trade associations figured the, the hit to municipalities in New York State, not counting New York City, was about a $60 million swing in value of material uh, over the last couple of years that's now got to come out of local budgets to, uh, that they used to rely on uh, get revenues from recyclables and uh, can't uh, do that anymore. 
Um, another lesson learned is about, uh, and I hinted at this earlier, about looking upstream to the production uh, uh, cycle of where raw materials come from and the like. Um, I've learned a lot about how not to trust conventional wisdom in this field um, because uh, things are always more complicated uh, than you uh, might expect that they are. Uh, particularly in this uh, use of life cycle of analysis, I assume that's something you guys are talking about uh, in this program. Um, <laughs> three o'clock every morning uh, in the middle of the night, I get a, uh, uh, an email from a listserv called Green Yes. Uh, which is folks like me, <laughs> really, uh, the U.S. primarily, that are asking questions and responding or whatever else. And there's just literally in the last week or so this raging debate over glass versus plastic versus aluminum. So, uh, and it came up because what you're seeing now at, at a variety of sporting events is this shift away from glass and plastic to aluminum, thinking that that's somehow better. So but the real question uh, that you can subject to life cycle analysis is that is that true or not? Um, is it better to buy water in a carton, a can, or a bottle? Anybody buy box water recently? That's been on the market for a uh, half dozen years now. I remember being stunned when I first saw it in, a, in an airport. Um, the right answer is best to get your water out of the tap uh, in a cup <laughs> as opposed to in a container. Um, the raging debate about uh, single use versus reusable, the plastic bag debate. The last thing I pulled off, uh, the web this afternoon before I left to come here is an, edit, uh, an uh, editorial from the uh, Wall Street Journal yesterday uh, entitled, Plastic Bags Help the Environment. Now, how, how many of you uh, think that that's uh, true based on what you have read or said about plastic, and plastic bags? Take a look at the, uh, the editorial. It's uh, by a guy named uh, John Tierney who's got a long history of being sort of an anachronistic uh, thinker in uh, this field. Um, but the real question is, if you're not using a plastic bag, what are you using differently? Um, here's the one that uh, New York City is uh, giving out. Bright orange, anybody see these around? Uh, it's got the uh, zero by 30, which means zero waste by 2030 is sort of the, uh, the mantra. It, they've now revised it to zero waste by 2040, maybe 2050, whatever. But um, so the question is, what's this made out of? How long is it going to last? Um, and what do I do with this uh, when I'm done with it, uh, where it starts to, to fail? Does it have a useful life? Is it re recyclable at the end? Um, and then you know, subject it to this life cycle analysis test uh, to, uh, to see what kind of answers you uh, come up with. Um, another lesson in this field, and I'm getting to the end of this section here, but I've got about five or 10 minutes left, is that the innovation in this field is just uh, staggering. Um, that uh, image on the, uh, the right-hand side is of a robotic sorter. If you can imagine the legs of that machine sitting over a conveyor belt in a recycling facility. Uh, I've seen these in operation. They are amazing, but that will replace about two uh, people um, and be more efficient at uh, uh, grabbing and sorting materials off the conveyor belt than the, the, than the human uh, labor can be. Um, they're not widespread yet, but they're just the latest example of how robotics are coming into uh, uh, this field. Um, what else do I have in my, uh, my bag here? This is a uh, bag from uh, Patagonia that's made out of 100% uh, recycled content. Plastics essentially being a storehouse of hydrocarbons. Uh, the question is, uh, how do you sort of recover and mine those for additional reuse and there are a handful of companies that are um, near commercial viability for um, uh, taking types of plastics and con converting it back into the basic uh, hydrocarbons and the like. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with is based in Oregon called Agilix, uh, A-G-I-L-Y-X, and they are partnering now with the polystyrene industry to take various types of styrene products that are in the market and turn those back into a styrene monomer that can be go, go back into the remanufacturing process. Um, they can also make oil out of it for various purposes, but the ability to sort of um, use uh, chemical processes to convert uh, that material uh, back into its raw form and, and repurpose it back to the processing uh, system uh, is uh, pretty amazing. 
Um, and then I talked a little bit about my uh, work in the uh, organics field over the last uh, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, uh, 20 years now uh, plus. Um, but in the recycling field, municipal recycling field, organics was barely talked about uh, until about 10 years ago. And in part, uh, it, it got a, a attention because uh, municipal recycling rates were stuck at about the 15 to 20 percent rate. And so everybody was looking at what do you do next? And uh, organics can be 30 percent of municipal uh, waste, uh, half of which is food waste, half of which is yard waste. And so the question is, were there ways to sort of go after that, uh, that material as a way of boosting diversion at the municipal uh, level? Um, some initial studies in that field showed that uh, of all the food that's produced for consumption, about 40% of it, it gets wasted at one stage or another. You've probably seen that number cr uh, cross over into the popular uh, press. Um, and that raises all sorts of, and a lot of that is at the uh, consumer uh, level, not just at the uh, uh, farming and, uh, and uh, uh, processing and distribution level. It's, uh, a lot of that is at the consumer level. Uh, which forces some real challenges around uh, what's, in, what, what's in that uh, composition, how do you collect it, what kinds of behavior changes do you need, how do you overcome the yuck factor uh, in various ways, uh, what are people going to be willing to do in terms of separating their organics, uh, which is part of why I had fun with uh, disposers um, representing in Syncreator because it's a very convenient, simple uh, answer. I would say in my home in Brooklyn, we haven't put any food waste at the curb for about 25 years now. Uh, literally use the disposer for 100% of what we have to uh, dispose of. But it's also stipulately a, a lot of mandatory diversion laws uh, over the last five or six years. If any of you are from Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, uh, they've had them in effect for a few. New York's is coming online in the next year or so. New Jersey's is still being debated but is close to being adopted that will require the diversion of organics, particularly from the commercial. Uh, waste stream first and then at the household level to follow. Um, a lot of innovations on the prevention side. Uh, you think about the ability to uh, reduce how much food waste gets generated through smarter uh, shopping uh, and cooking and uh, use of leftovers and all those kinds of things. Uh, take a look at the Love Food Hate Waste campaign that was launched in the UK and has spread uh, across Canada in the last uh, several years and what it's been able to achieve in terms of reducing uh, food waste generation by 15, 20 percent, which in this business is, uh, is significant. Um, and then I already talked about the integration with who else in the municipal and the utility system is handling uh, liquid uh, waste as a resource. And so this uh, integration between the solid waste folks and the liquid waste folks has been fun to be a part of the last uh, number of years. There are probably 100 uh, wastewater utilities in the U.S. now that are taking in commercial food waste in various ways, including uh, there's one that just finally opened in Trenton that's been in the works for at least a dozen years and is finally taking in its first loads of uh, commercial food waste to, uh, to make biogas. Um, you're not going to read this either, but this is from the UK a report about uh, progress on uh, these issues around reducing uh, food waste and the effect, effectiveness of the Love Food Hate Waste campaign. Um, and then another new concept that's coming into the field is uh, zero waste. How many of you have been hearing that the last uh, few years or so? Started on the West Coast probably 10, 12 years ago, and uh, uh, I knew it was gradually going to end up here, and it has in a big way. Um, there, uh, there's a national organization around zero waste, an international organization around it. They're providing a framework for talking about uh, waste differently. Um, they're working with uh, cities to use that language to adopt uh, new aspirational goals. Uh, but also hidden in that is a debate over what is zero waste and is it ever achievable or is it simply an aspirational goal that you should uh, work towards? And particularly around does it mean New York City right now uses it to say zero waste to landfills, but it still sends a lot of its residential waste to uh, waste to energy facilities like the one in Newark or uh, one in Niagara Falls or one in Chester, Pennsylvania. And does that count or not? Um, uh, more recent uh, concept in, in this uh, field in the last five years or so has been that of the circular economy. Um, it's a very complicated uh, concept, but it's around 
uh, recovering of materials and putting them back into a remanufacturing loop as either a mechanical or a biological feedstock uh, and organizing uh, the uh, you know product markets uh, around that uh, idea, uh, catching on with an enormous uh, amount of uh, energy behind it. Uh, the work of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in the UK has been the principal driver for that. Um, and then uh, more recently, the concept of EPR, extended producer responsibility, is uh, taking hold in a number of ways. And in part, this is the the idea here is that. Uh, Municipalities, going back 30 years ago when recycling programs started, sort of uh, footed the bill for paying for those uh, systems, for creating the infrastructure, the education and outreach, the uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, certainly in the last couple of years, municipalities are saying that we can't afford to do that anymore. So how do we shed that responsibility and who ought to be taking it up and so the shift has been to push that onto manufacturers to take responsibility for the end of life recovery, uh, recycling and uh, reuse of the products that they put into the market. Um, so there are a number of uh, provinces in Canada that have adopted this as a framework. Uh, the British Columbia one is the one I'm most familiar with. There's also one in Quebec. Uh, British Columbia, literally the whole curbside recycling program is now run by industry, not by the municipal uh, governments there. Um, and so uh, I was actually on a conference call this afternoon that there's a bill being introduced in the New York State Legislature to begin that discussion more aggressively in New York. I'm sure it will happen in New Jersey as well about adopting that framework, uh, whether it's for uh, the whole uh, broad span of materials or begins to target Things like uh, paint, uh, paint recovery programs are now in about eight or ten states, including New York just uh, passed a paint recovery uh, uh, law last year that's uh, being implemented. Um, discussions about going after mattresses and carpeting. Uh, bottle bills is another sort of type of uh, uh, EPR thing, but this concept of sort of who ought to take responsibility for paying for uh, re uh, recovery of these materials once they've uh, had their uh, uh, useful life uh, over uh, is really changing the conversation uh, hugely. Um, and, and it's particularly hit the plastics industry hard. They've been enormously under siege the last uh, year or two. Um, and the question about uh, single-use plastic bags to uh, foam cups uh, to um, you know, straws, whatever, all those kinds of things are sort of just the tip of the iceberg of that uh, discussion. And in some ways, you know, I've been in this uh, field too long to not be a little bit cynical about, you know, going after, you know, things like straws as thinking that you're really going to accomplish something. But the broader issues about how plastics get uh, uh, recovered and put back into the reprocessing uh, system is a, is a really important one. Um, I already talked about the mechanical versus chemical a little bit. Um, not sure how this slide got in there, but this is a, uh, a page out of one of those uh, reports I mentioned earlier that's focused on textiles. This is from the UK talking about, you know, this is uh, the way that, the, I guess the point here is that the way that uh, data in this field is being generated uh, so that it can drive policy uh, debates and decisions about uh, how to do one thing or another. And if you, if you understand that there's 921,000 tons of used textiles generated in the UK every year, um, then you can start to figure out uh, how you go after that in a, in a meaningful way. And uh, there's a, a, a lot of uh, innovation going on in that field as well. So I'll end up with some uh, cultural references. Uh, these are from other presentations that I've done uh, several years ago, the movie The Martian with Matt Damon. Uh, if you recall uh, where he, uh, for those of you that saw it, I see a few smiles here that he was uh, figuring out how to survive on Mars by himself and uh, that's what he did. Uh, the Wes Anderson uh, Isle of Dogs uh, movie, Island of Dogs movie from uh, two years ago, I guess. Uh, I watched it mostly for the uh, piles of garbage uh, that were uh, <laughs> uh, in, the, in the background of that. Uh, last year I had a lot of fun with my uh, friends watching uh, Toy Story 4. Anybody see that? Uh, what to do, uh, you know what Forky is? Forky was, you know, a little plastic fork that the young girl made into a little, uh, what, you know, doll or whatever. And he kept trying to, Forky kept trying to jump into the waste can, thinking it was a single-use item. 
and uh, uh, whatever. You have to watch the movie. Um, and then last year, there was a play on Broadway called Gary uh, by Taylor Mac uh, 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 with uh, Nathan Lane in the lead role. And it was about the, um, who, cleans up after, who cleans up the mess uh, after we're done uh, destroying everything. And uh, again, I, I saw that play with my daughter, and um, uh, she was watching it for one thing, because she's in the theater, and I was watching it for who cleans up the mess. Uh, which, we, uh, and I'll end with this, is that uh, at its core, and I try not to think too hard about this, otherwise I'd go crazy on a daily basis, but waste is a uh, detestably profane thing. There's a sociologist at NYU uh, who wrote a book a couple years ago after working as a sand worker in New York for several months to sort of really get a first-hand feel for what it means to be on the street uh, picking up other people's trash every night. Uh, and as a sociologist, you know, she was able to figure out uh, the demographics of different neighborhoods based on their trash. Uh, but more importantly, the book was about the real people behind uh, the, the trash that we uh, generate and how we expect it to uh, just disappear, to go away, and be ready for it to have a clean city the, the next day or so. My work over the last four years with the commercial waste industry in New York and some of these companies I've known for 30 years or so, I have enormous amount of respect for the people that do this work every night and get no uh, credit. Uh, they often just get uh, vilified uh, for, the, for the work that they do. But it's important to realize that everything that we uh, uh, generate as waste, uh, somebody else is cleaning up behind us. And I will end with that and uh, look forward to your questions and uh, comments. Thank you very much.